Good afternoon. My name is Finkel Desai. I am a leukemia physician at Weill Cornell Medicine. Today, I'm going to talk about venetoclax-based strategies in AML. Thank you for the organizers um, to invite uh, in, for inviting me to talk about um, this very exciting topic. Here are my disclosures. So we're going to talk today about venetoclax strategies in newly diagnosed AML, a little bit about relapsed AML, combinations with other targeted therapies, and mechanisms of venetoclax resistance. If we go over the mechanism of action, we know venetoclax is a pro-apoptotic molecule. Um, the way it works is, see, normally BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic protein, sequesters BH3 proteins that are important uh, for triggering apoptosis in the mitochondria. What ABT199 or venetoclax does is it occupies the space uh, with BCL2, thus desequestering uh, de or freeing the BH3 that then goes and makes a complex with BAX and BAC uh, that uh, leads to an oligomerization of these molecules. This further um, activates caspases and mitochondrial permeabilization leading to apoptosis. There are several possible mechanisms of resistance to venetoclax, including MCL1 and genomic deletion of Pax, which we'll talk about briefly at the end of the presentation, and several um, targeted uh, or novel uh, approaches in order to overcome this. The initial phase one and two trials of hypomethylating agents and venetoclax um, showed very promising uh, results. Uh, the doses that were tested were ranged from 400 to 1200 milligrams, but the ultimate dose that was recommended was 400 milligrams. As you look at this, the two-year overall survival rate with 400 milligrams of venetoclax was 51%, which is not minor in an elderly uh, intensive chemotherapy ineligible patient population. Moreover, the duration of response after achieving the CR was also um, high. If it is not relevant to patients, it's not important to patients if the duration of response is very small. But as we see here, venetoclax 400 milligrams, the median duration of CR was about 12.5 months. Moreover, what was seen um, was several, all of these several you know, different patient subgroups also benefited from this combination therapies. If you look at the overall response rate, about 74% achieved a CR or NCRI. In the intermediate group, this was 74%. Poor group, this was 59%. In de novo, and secondary AML for both uh, subgroups, 67% CR rate, which is pretty um, significant, especially for the secondary AML population where we're not used to seeing these kind of a CRs, um, CR uh, numbers. For both ages less than 75 and over 75, again, the responses were seen in both um, subgroups. These responses were mutation agnostic, and that we, the more common mutations that we see, um, there were responses seen across the board. FLT3, 72%, IDH, 71%, NPM1, 91%, and TP53, although lower, 47% um, CR, CRI rate for a TP53 mutated AML is actually pretty um, good. Uh, the FLT3 mutations are interesting, and there might be a mechanism of resistance there. We'll talk about that um, later. But the important part is that uh, mutation agnostic responses were, were actually seen for the major classifications of, uh, of mutations. This led to approval of the drug um, before the phase three results were, were out. And um, what is more important is the phase three VLA trial um, was also positive and met its uh, primary endpoint of survival. This was a randomized study of azacitidine plus venetoclax um, versus azacitidine plus placebo. At a median follow-up of uh, 20.5 months, there was a 34% reduction in the risk of death uh, favoring the azacitidine plus venetoclax group. The median overall survival with uh, venetoclax combination was about 15 months, and it was nine months for the azacitidine lone arm. Within subgroup analysis, as you look at this, uh, 
most of the subgroups showed um, is a cytidine plus menetoclax to be better, um, both for ages less than and over 75 for de novo and secondary AML, both for intermediate and porous cytogenetics, as well as all the mutation um, subtypes of particular um, importance is IDH um, uh, and NPM1, where responses were um, seen uh, uh, in majority of patients. Same thing with AML with myelodysplasia related changes. Um, it also favored um, is a cytidine to um, and venetoclax. The second combination of uh, venetoclax is lotus RC, again in elderly. Uh, upfront patients. These were data from the phase um, one and two studies that combined um, lotus RC with venetoclax. The overall response rate was 54%. Um, this might seem lower compared to the HMA combination, but the patients that went to, onto these trials, most of them um, were, were higher risk secondary AML um, potentially previous exposure to HMA, which is why patients prefer to go on a venetoclax to a lotus RC combination. So if you, in that context, these CR rates are, are um, pretty comparable. In terms of cytogenetic risk, the intermediate risk 63% CR, poor risk 42%. Um, the prior HMA use is relevant here. Um, about 33% responses in patients who've had prior HMA um, therapy, which is obviously lower, but um, comparable to what uh, is expected out of this very difficult to treat and highly resistant patient population. And if you look at the de novo AML, this is what I mean, that 71% showed a, a CR, um, a plus CRI response was 71%, which is very comparable to the HMA combination. Um, so. The lotus was, uh, was as a combination with venetoclax, was um, also um, used and approved uh, uh, previous. The, the phase three study that actually randomized venetoclax plus lotus compared to lotus RSC alone did not meet its primary endpoint of uh, 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 overall survival. But this is an option for patients who've had uh, multiple previous HMA as part of their uh, MDS in the past and they progress to AML, for example, using the same backbone may not be helpful. And in that situation, it could be considered um, that lotus RC would be used in combination with venetoclax. Now, a little bit of practical, um, you know, concepts in management of venetoclax toxicities. This is, you know, usually a very well tolerated regimen. There's some um, unique aspects of management of venetoclax, which uh, we're going to talk right now. Um, tumor lysis is one of them. The trials included patients only when the gold WBC was about 25,000. However, hydroxyurea um, was allowed to reach that um, level. So that was one way to reduce the risk of tumor lysis. Um, usually in the trials, the escalation of venetoclax dose happened in patient. And the way this was done was the first day was 100, then 200, and then 400. We did not use um, azole prophylaxis during the escalation phase, just to not um, have too many um, dose variations. Tumor lysis precautions that are usual, including allopurinol, fluids, and laboratory monitoring. All of this was um, done pretty uh, um, consistently in these trials, and the risk of tumor lysis was actually very low in these AML patients. Now, cytopenias are different. They're obviously not relevant during induction, but they do become relevant in the post-induction sort of maintenance or consolidation cycles. Usually during induction, the trials looked at for 28 days of, um, of drug. We sometimes, depending on the patient's frailty or if there's an ongoing sepsis, um, tend to do a bone marrow biopsy after 21 days. And if the, the marrow is ablated to stop venetoclax and give GCSF support to, um, uh, to bring the uh, uh, white cell count up faster. Um, cytopenias post-induction, uh, the management of these are important because it's not only relevant in preventing complications from cytopenias, but also patient quality of life. Um, the first strategy is to delay the cycles, usually give about a two-week delay, um, allow the accounts to fully recover before the next cycle begins. Most of the time, the cycles are every six weeks with this regimen compared to the four weeks we are used to um, in the past. 
The second um, strategy is reduction of the duration of um, uh, Benetta Clax use from 28 to 21 to 14 days, depending on how the patients are tolerating um, these cycles. If there are persistent cytopenias, even on this, um, the the next step would be to dose reduce the venetoclax itself from 400 to 200 milligram or um, dose reduce the hypomethylating agents. Um, but these would be the usual sort of chronologic steps we follow um, to make sure that the cytopenias are appropriate. Um, obviously, GCSF use during cytopenias are, are helpful for prevention of, um, of neutropenia or quick reversal of neutropenia uh, when these cytopenias happen. The other mo um, common thing that we encounter is interactions with azole. Venoclax has those interactions with, with CYP3A um, inhibitors and azoles are, are big on that. We avoid azoles during dose escalations. 50% um, dose reduction is recommended for the moderate inhibitors, fluconazole and isofluconazole, and 75% dose reduction with boriconazole and posaconazole. On the package insert, it's actually 70 milligrams of venetoclax with posaconazole, but um, you know it's very hard to get the 70 milligrams, so we generally favor a 100 milligram um, dose. Uh, it's important to note that it's not just the azoles, but it's of several other medications that our patients frequently are on, can have uh, dose uh, modifications, and we have to have a comprehensive look at the patient's medications to make sure that this will not interfere with venetoclax um, dosing. These include diltiazem, verapamil, cipro, um, PGP inhibitors like amiodarone and carvedilol, and digoxin, you know, PGB substrate with narrow therapeutic index should be um, taken like six hours before venetoclax dose. Um, usually a good medication interaction um, check is, is, uh, is important or any new drug that has to be started has to be checked for venetoclax um, interactions. Now in terms of the um, you know, upfront response rate, if you compare uh, venetoclax regimens to any other elderly newly diagnosed um, uh, you know, AML regimens, the responses are pretty high. Um, you have a 76% CR rate compared to, um, let's say, with lorazeracy and glastegib, 22%, single agent, 20%. With the IDH inhibitors, about 34 to 40%. With liposomal anthracycline and cytarabine, it's 47%. Gemtuzumab, Ozogamicin, 26%. So this is a very good option for elderly patients who are not eligible for intensive um, chemotherapy that gives responses across multiple cytogenetic subgroups and mutation types. The next question that does come up is, does it clear MRD? So we do have a high rate of people achieving CR. But how do we cure these people? Um, you know, can we can having an MRD negativity rate improve survival and increases the chance of being transplanted uh, or with improved outcomes in transplant? Um, what we saw in the phase two studies is the with the 400 milligram dose, um, there is a combination gave a 45% MRD negativity rate. This is um, pretty impressive in a patient a population that's elderly and could be made up of um, secondary AML or complex um, uh, karyotype. There's not a lot of data on transplant outcomes after venetoclax. There was one um, abstract that lo looked at um, the phase one and two studies and looked at outcomes after transplant. Approximately 10% of patients on these trials, which was 31 patients, were transplanted. And the general overall survival post stem cell SCT or stem cell transplant was 68% at 12 months. If you look at um, what is the a group of patients that were transplanted um, here on the left table, it's quite consistent with what you know we see: uh, adverse cytogenetics, 39%; intermediate, 58%. Um, most of people who went on to a transplant had a CR or a CRI, um, which uh, makes sense. Um, what is important is 55% of patients remained in remission for at least one year after a stem cell transplant and 12 patients are alive more than two years after a transplant. Um, there's not, uh, this, this did not have MRD data um, at, the, at the moment, but I think with the phase three trial now being read, it would be increasingly important to look at um, transplant outcomes um, in patients who did um, get transplanted versus um, the um, standard of care. 
Now we know when our clients respond, but there are obviously, re there are resistance patterns. We see patients who do not respond upfront and we do see patients who relapse quickly. And um, this um, abstract, which was presented um, at, at uh, ASCO um, showed the mutation sort of spectrum um, in patients who had a durable remission or, or a remission and then a relapse versus primary um, refractory. And if you look at this in terms of the durable remission, the IDH and the NPM1 seemed to be the, the, the uh, uh, common mutation types uh, in terms of remission, but uh, an early relapse uh, expected complex karyotype and TP53. And the primary refractory types um, it was uh, again these um, you know complex karyotype and um, a PTPN um, eleven. There was um, another abstract that looked at survival uh, for IDH um, and spliceosome mutants, which were considered more sort of the responsive uh, mutation subtypes. And you look at on this um, trial on the left, the FLIT three an ITD uh, of either having a FLIT3 ITD or PTPN PN11 um, um, mutations uh, showed a much lower survival compared to the um, IDH1 um, subtypes. So we know there are certain um, predictors of resistance and um, there have been strategies to try to look at what we can do to overcome venetoclax resistance. Um, one is upfront combinations with targeted therapy. So if FLIT3 ITD is a poor uh, marker, um, there are uh, currently trials ongoing that have combined, um, for example, uh, hypomethylating agents, gilturtinib, and um, a venetoclax um, that have shown promising uh, results, but uh, you know further data are, are anticipated. And in terms of um, resistance to, because of um, MCL1 upregulation, which tends to sort of re-sequester the BH3 proteins, which we talked about previously, there are currently um, trials ongoing with uh, MCL1 inhibitors uh, that could uh, would, that would be helpful. And there have been in vitro data that using MCL1 inhibition can not only sort of rescue the resistance to venetoclax, but also if given early on upfront might actually delay or prevent the resistance to a uh, venetoclax. So these are all very exciting strategies that are being used in, um, in uh, AML uh, for overcoming venetoclax resistance. In terms of relapsed refractory ML, now this is off-label use. I just have one slide. Um, you know, there's a lot of institutions are using this off-label. The um, the idea is generally the CRs do tend to happen in about one month, which is pretty much um, consistently seen everywhere. Um, the ranges have been like 12 to 50 percent in different series, depending on whether they've had prior HMA, uh, you know, and whether there's complex karyotype or not. But consistently, the duration of CR is short. Um, some patients seem to benefit by going into transplant um, therapy, but further, um, you know, I think that in the use of venetoclax in relapse refractory ML is yet to be completely hashed out, and there are several trials ongoing to establish the best partner to um, look at that. Now, understandably, because of its importance with HMA combinations, venetoclax combinations are now being tested with intensive chemotherapy. Um, the two trials that have presented some data uh, was one was in combination with 5 and 2, uh, where venetoclax was given for 14 days, including a seven day ramp up. The overall CR, CRI rate was 71%, 42% in secondary AML. Prior HMA therapy, 43%, which is, I think, interesting. Um, TP53, 33% as expected. And again, NPM1 runs and IDH, which tend to be more responsive, 98%. Another trial that combined FLAG-IDA with venetoclax um, showed a CRCRI rate of 73%. There were significant toxicities with the initial venetoclax dose of 21 days, which was later than dose reduced to 14, along with the cytarabine dose reduction. Uh, and these, this is all obviously small trials, but um, further data are awaited to see if this actually truly improves over what is expected out of a single agent. Um, chemotherapy regimen. Um, more important is, um, you know, toxicities in this uh, situation in the relapsed and refractory, um, uh, you know, patient population. This ends my um, um, talk. Thank you for listening. Um, I am, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for um, uh, any questions that might come.